You are listening to One Nation Under Crime, a chronological true crime podcast. Each week, we go through our nation's history and discuss one case from each year, starting in 1800. I'm Kayla. And I'm Leah. And we're to episode eight. Made it to eight. Woo-hoo! Eight is great. I know. If you listen to our last episode, you know that eight is one of Leah's favorite numbers. It is my favorite number. Not one <laughs> of. It is. So... Sorry. So yeah, this week, uh, this week we got an interesting case. I like interesting. I'll say that. Um, I'll go ahead and put it out there. This is probably a medium level trigger warning case, Mm -hmm. um, and we'll go over it when we get to it. But um, it does deal with an entire family, so that's not so great. Um, Obviously, murder and crime is never good. Which is, so I was listening to. Um, the podcast Sinisterhood the other day and which <laughs> such a great name for a podcast Sinisterhood. Um, they do like cryptids, which I thought are you like, said the podcast of Mr. Hood, no Sinisterhood. Okay. So, so they do like cryptids, which are like Bigfoot and Nessie and they do episodes about that, but then they do episodes. Nessie is real. I know Nessie is real. Okay. So is Bigfoot. Just saying. Um, I don't know about that. I just know Nessie's real. If Nessie's real, but it's real. Anyways, um, so they, but they cover crime. They cover like a huge wide variety of things. And one of the things that they talked about on their show the other day is, uh, it's, it's an older episode. I think it's from earlier this year, but was why women are so invested in true crime. Specifically women, because a lot of women do follow true crime. I mean, look at the Oxygen Channel. The Oxygen Channel, it used to not be crime 24-7. They just did that in the past few years. But Mm -hmm. it was so interesting because... all the Lifetime movies are centered around a crime. Right. So what's so funny about it is that personally, I have theories, but personally... It's one of those things of like, as women, like we want to know kind of things about it. But as women, a lot of times with brutal crimes, like we're often a target. Mm. So one of the things that they discussed, which was interesting, was that you want to know more about it because it could happen. You want to know how to protect yourself. Right. So I guess that would kind of be it. And and I mean... Personally, for me, it's always a why. Mm. I'm always a What's why. What's the motive? What yeah. were they thinking? Why? Why did Why did this happen? Why? You know, why did you think of this or or anything like that? And we'll see in this case that um, there's some speculation as to why, and things could have gone very differently, hmm. which is unfortunate. In some cases, this is also a case that um, we'll get to it in a bit, but uh, very, very hard to find information on, even though it is a very fascinating case and it's very interesting. Um, I had to use some sources that I don't like to use and we'll get to it. So our sources for this week. Um, Touring Main History, South End Stories, Parkaman Magazine, uh, Strange New England, and Murder She Told. Murder She Told. We'll get to it. Mm-hmm. Is that like Murder She Wrote? Yes. Play on that? Yes. Gotcha. So, um, This is, like I said, episode eight. This is about the Purrington family massacre. Purrington. Purrington, which is, you know, my sense of humor. And one of these uh, sources that I used, it's uh, kind of a blog, but kind of like a history, you know, type thing. They really go in depth with with different things. And somebody, somebody commented on it and said, I know what I'm naming my next cat. Purrington. I mean. (laughs) That's so funny. So, yes, we are covering the Purrington Family Massacre in 1806. So, let's get into it. Um, Some events in 1806 that were going on. 
January 8th, Lewis and Clark find the skeleton of a 105-foot blue whale in Oregon. Ooh. March 29th, construction is authorized uh, for the National Road, and that is the first United States federal highway. Ooh, interesting. May 30th, future President Andrew Jackson fights his second duel, killing um, an attorney whose name was Charles Dickinson, who had accused Jackson's wife of bigamy. And uh, fun fact about that duel. Was it in Weehawken? No. Uh, Jackson. Because everything is legal in New Jersey. Everything. Jackson, uh, for the rest of his life, had a bullet lodged (gasps) close to his heart. Um, What a souvenir. hmm? What a souvenir. So July 15th, the Pike Expedition uh, near St. Louis, Missouri, United States Army Lieutenant Zebulon Pike uh, leads an expedition. That's a fun name. That's what I'm naming my next cat. Zebulon. Zebulon. Um, He leads an expedition from Fort Bellefontaine to explore the West. Uh, November 15th. So the last one was July. This is now November, right? Uh, During his second exploratory expedition, Lieutenant Zebulon Pike sees a distant mountain peak. While near the Colorado foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And that is why it is named Pikes Peak. <gasps> I, so if you ever heard of Pikes Peak in Colorado. I do. That's why. I may or may not know someone who may or may not have removed some rocks from Pikes Peak and brought them to Alabama. It may or may not be illegal to do so. That is all I have to say on that matter. Allegedly. Allegedly. (laughs) Uh, There wasn't a specific date for this one, but I had to put it in here. Uh, In 1806, Noah Webster published the first American English dictionary. So Webster's Dictionary. So it was just interesting. Um, August of 1805. The Purrington family moves from Bowdenham, Maine, to Augusta to start a new chapter of their lives. And July 9th of 1806, Captain James Purrington brutally murders almost all of his family before taking his own life. That is so sad. Mm-hmm. So we'll start so it's with... a murder-suicide situation. It is. Mm-hmm. And it could have not been. Oh. Yes. Um, Augusta, Maine was first inhabited in 1628 by the Plymouth Colony as a fur trading post. But due to the natives uprising against the settlers and the decline in trading in the area, the area was sold in 1661 and it actually remained unoccupied for 75 years. Which is crazy. During the French and Indian War, a block house, which I've seen these before. Um, in certain like movies and and things like that, it, it's a small fort, is what it is. But it looks like so the bottom is smaller than the top. It's like if you took a small footprint of a house and you took the base of it, like the first floor, right, and then you put a bigger house on top of it. That's what it looks like. Okay, it's very interesting. It it it's. Almost like at the beach where you I was have say, it still, makes me think of the houses on stilts, but the bottom of it is actually part smaller, of the house. Smaller. Yeah. And it's smaller yeah. in. So the sides of the house kind of hang off. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. if you put a big box on top of a small box, mm-hmm. that's kind of what it looks like. Um, and it's named Fort Western, and that actually Fort Western will come back um, in this story. Uh, But it was on the eastern bank of the Kennebec River, and that was built in 1754. Uh, This is now the oldest wooden fort in America. It still stands today. Interesting. Fort Western was intended to be a supply depot for Fort Halifax, and it was to protect the region from French attack. Benedict Arnold used Fort Western as a staging area during the American Revolutionary War, before they moved upriver to the Battle of Quebec 
where a man may or may not have caught a bullet in the neck in Quebec. <laughs> In summary. Um, <clears throat> so the area was named Augusta in 1797, and the seat for the county was uh, done in 1799. Maine finally became a state in 1820, and Augusta became the capital in 1827. So technically, our case, while in America, it wasn't in a state. It wasn't a state yet. Hmm. Just part of the colony. Have you been to Maine? I have not. It's very pretty. Farthest north I've been is um, New York. I went to New York. No. No. Wait. Yes. No. Wait. No. Wait. no. Wait. Yes. No. Yes. Pennsylvania. Below. Above? Uh, New York's going to be I don't higher do than Pennsylvania. I just said I don't. I don't do math. Or maps. Maps. Yeah. Geography. Geography. Um. <laughs> I've been to Maine. Um, I went twice, actually, two different summers on I've mission trips. I've always heard it's very pretty. It's it is very pretty. Um, I went Light in the summertime. And such. Mm-hmm. Went to um, Bangor. It's not Bangor. It's Bangor. Bangor. And they do. We have a listener that's uh, in Canada, kind of close okay. to that edge. Um, it's, Hello, Canadian listeners. Hi. Um, and our, our neighbors to the north. Yes, it is. It is a very, very pretty state. I would like to go now as an adult, and also, you know, I mean, I loved going there doing mission work, and we did um, backyard Bible clubs, and we stayed at Hudson College. It was very, very lovely little campus. It's a small college, mm-hmm. um, lovely little campus. Um, um, and a little side note: I met my prom date in my senior prom date in Maine. There was another church group there from cleveland tennessee um who i know um hi adam if you're listening he's still my friend we did not get married but he he got married to a lovely lovely lady and they have three boys three boys and a parcel of animals um farm and he's still a very wonderful friend actually um texted me when we had tornadoes come through and checked on Mm -hmm. me like hey um they said your county. Are are you okay? Like he, he and you're really, like, try three doors down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, um, oh, we're okay, but man, it was close. Anyway, um, just a little sidebar there. But Maine is beautiful, and I would love to go back. I've always wanted to go up to that area. I've always wanted to go to Boston too. Boston, oh yeah, uh, we talked about um, Boston last. Episode, new but. kids are there. Hello, but oh, went to Acadia. <laughs> Look, I'm telling you, you have Backstreet Boys. I have new kids. People forget that Mark Wahlberg is a felon. I just want to go ahead and put Mark that out was there. not one of the new kids. So you need to he's shut your face with that. To one of them. But he's not a new I'm kid. Just saying, so you need to just shut your face Donnie, with that. Donnie is the new I'm kid. I'm very aware that Donnie is it, but I'm just saying in relation to Boston, <laughs> while I. Love. Just because someone is a felon does not well, mean that they are cannot be a good person. I'm pretty sure he killed someone. Hey, you don't know? You don't know? You don't have the facts? About to find out. That's what uh, we're about look, to do right now. You can't just look. You just just because somebody look, people change. I'm they, I'm saying I know that people change, <sighs> but I'm also saying you can't just say that he's people, a felon. I just I mean people don't remember these. There are things. some felonies that are not really that bad. Uh, I mean, uh-huh. I'm just saying. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying. Mm-hmm. I'm, just, I'm saying. just saying. But anyway, I'm aware that they are in Boston. Acadia National Park in Maine is beautiful. Now, I'm not saying, people, I'm not saying to go out and commit a felony. I'm I'm not saying that. I'm just saying she came at me really hard about my boys, and I love the boys in the band. Um, I may have gone with my two other two besties who love the new kids like I do. He was charged with attempted murder. Okay, attempted. And you don't know all the details of the case. It could be that it was accidental, but it still He pled guilty to assault and was sentenced to two years. Okay, but who threw hands first? You don't know all the details. I'm pretty sure it was Just because of the way things are listed, you don't know. (laughs) If you don't know the case, don't start speaking to it. I have friends who are in all the law uh, stuff. You don't know. You might. It's a racially motivated hate crime. (sighs) I don't. Look, I don't know all the details. You don't know all the details. I'm looking at them right now. Uh, I'm just saying. Why you got to drag this stuff up? Because I'm saying it was, it, it, it happened in 1988. All I'm saying. Were you even alive then? 1991. 
Okay, so then shut your face. <laughs> He was only 16 years old. Okay. But I'm just saying, you, there, look, there's Why some, you gotta bring that up? You, just, you brought Dinkas up. It was just, it was a fun, it was a fact that I remembered that I forgot that I remembered. But I say that to say because I was listening to something the other day and they were talking about how, um, like people have done certain things and like, how they're just kind of forgotten and swept under the rug or something. And oh, somebody so goes, God, did it? you know that Mark Wahlberg was a charge with attempted murder? And I was like, I'm sorry, do what? Well, he's not the I same mean, he's person. Beautiful. No, and he has said that he's not the same person and everything. However, still, there's a guy on TikTok who does a fantastic Mark Wahlberg impression. And he always makes the joke and he always includes Donnie. In his jokes, because he's, because you know, Mark Wahlberg's like all hyped all the time. Like he's, yeah. like he's ready to fight somebody. And, he, and he's like, why would you talk about that? Huh? Why would you talk to me like that? He's like, Donnie, I think we're going to have to teach this guy a lesson. Let's go. <laughs> and it's just, it's, I, I don't have to remember his TikTok. But anyway, it, you made he, me sad bringing that up, talking does, about people. See, we were talking what? about love everybody, be kind to everybody. Is, is he's a felon. Podcast. I mean, um, but just saying, you made me sad. You hurt my heart. You'll be fine. Talking about people. You'll be fine. Talking. I mean, think, trying to just say think he was about, new kids, just think about one, new kids. He was a little brother. Well, think about number the, two. He's a felon, you know. Well, I mean, <laughs> sometimes things happen. Number three, you he was a kid. Me. You know me. I you know, know that's you. where my mind is going to go. I'm be like, oh, I'm sorry. Hey, but I feel judgment coming from you, and it, it just makes me sad. Did I not? I need you to cleanse your aura. Point out to you that one of them has an HGTV show. Yes, and I love it. So there you go. Farm and Fixer. I love John. I do like it, and it's so funny because it, it's, it is, it's the, like, he's, it's, he is, he is one of the His accent and what he does oh, does not him. match. Oh, no, it does. Well, I to love me, him. it he's doesn't. He's always been the sensitive one. Like, I got to tell y'all, growing up, Jordan Knight, oh, my goodness, when he hit those high notes, oh, uh, he was my very favorite. Let me tell y'all, my husband. He can hit those high notes, and I love it. I can't. I can't I, I'm this. telling you. But he was my favorite, and John was like his older brother, and I always thought he was so cool and so sweet. I, I love what he does. I think it's perfect. I, I love it's it. It's just so funny. He's so sensitive with because the animals. We like, have all these, like, HGTV uh, shows. Like, we've talked about them before, like Hometown and Fixer Upper. I do love Hometown. I love Hometown. Well, but I it's love so, Chip. Yeah. Um, well. I, I like I like Ben and Aaron better. Sorry. I like him differently. I I like him differently. Yeah. I think Ben and Aaron are more like us. I think that's true. I think when I also stood back and realized that Joanna Gaines just rips down all the walls and makes everything white and that's not really revolutionary, I think was when I went, huh. Then I found Ben and Aaron show, and I was like, "Oh, there's more more color." I, I, I look over well, that. Well, and they extent. don't just tear all the walls down there. And they mm-hmm. actually, they're like, "We're gonna build a wall here." And it's like, "I'm sorry, what? <laughs> You're <laughs> what?" <laughs> but anyways, all that to say, this is a case about murder. So let's get back to it. <laughs> You got me fired up. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. It's just, you know how my mind works. You say one thing and then I'm like, you know, my brain like runs 20 steps ahead of like your mouth. So you say new kids immediately. I think Wahlberg, I think Mark Wahlberg. And then we're talking about murder. So like clearly. But you know my love for them. I do know your love. You see their mom died recently. It was very sad. Very sad. It's very sad. Um. No, I mean, they seem like really super nice guys. It was just one of those things. And I was like, when somebody said that the other day, I was like, sorry, what? It did, did happen. I'm sorry. It did. What? Anyway, you weren't even alive. I was not alive. I was not even thought about being alive at that point. It's fine. Um, so, yeah. This case. <laughs> back on track to just depress Leah more. Um. <laughs> This is a super hard case to find information on. There is an account of the crime that is called, in all caps, with an exclamation point, horrid murder. 
Horrid. I like that word. Horrid. Horrid. Um, but as far as anything else, it was super fine, super hard to find any additional information. Um, the family is also listed in various sources as Purinton with one R and Purinton with two R's. So kind of like the Durham, Durham, Durham thing. Um, you know, Durham, Durham, all those kind of the same thing. Uh, so two of the sources I named at the top are podcasts. And I don't like, mm. I did not listen to them. I will say that. I did not listen to them. However, um, both of them have websites that they. They can be quoted. Not, not so much that they um, type out exact word for word. It's kind of like a news article mm-hmm. kind of that they put on there. Um, so I did use those. They have amazing notes to read through on their websites. Um, so once you're done with this episode, please, 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 you know, if you want more information, go listen to them. Um, and those are the podcast uh, Murder She Told, which is, I think, a really good name. That is a fun name. I, yeah, she totally told. got that. Um, My and granny loved Murder She Wrote. It's <laughs> a good show. But uh, it's Murder She Told. And that episode isn't very long. Again, I didn't listen to it, but I think it was only like 27 minutes. It was, it was pretty digestible. There's not a lot to... Yeah. And then the other one is called Strange New England. And Strange New England had, I mean, their information that they put on their website was very, very informative and well, very I'm helpful. I'm sure there's a lot. I mean, but those it, are the only two p- places I saw yeah. anyone cover it. Well, what I was going to say though, Strange New England, it makes sense that there would be a podcast just for New England because, yeah. I mean, that's where so much has happened. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's a lot, so much history there. Mm-hmm. I would love to just like go to New England and just see maybe all the when history we go there. On, maybe when we do our live shows, when we <laughs> become super popular and yes. we do live shows, we could just do, we could take the, the what is it, the Patriot Trail and we'll just go up sure. the Patriot Trail and Absolutely. just do shows along the way. It's fine. And I'll color. Tell everyone about our podcast, guys. Uh, so we can do live shows or do um, <laughs> I mean, maybe I'll like take art classes. And so I'll like, you know, draw some of the audience or something. Them. Look at you. So fancy. Not going to happen. No. So anyways, go listen to those podcasts. I, I, I heavily want to say that I did get information from them. I want it to be known that, you know, they are podcasts. I am aware They did their research, and they have very, very, very good information, and they deserve all the credit for that. Um, I did not quote anything from them directly, but the information that I got is from there, so I just want to make that immensely clear. Um, Go support them if you haven't already or if you don't. Um, So Captain James Scales Purrington was born in Bowdenham, Maine in 1760. James's father was from Cape Cod and his mother from North Yarmouth. At a young age, Yarmouth. At a young age, Purrington uh, married Elizabeth Betsy Clifford. A lot of women named Elizabeth back then. Yeah. A lot of it. Because we had Elizabeth Fales. Queen. And then we had Elizabeth Schuyler. I mean, it's just, anyways. Well, it's a very regal name. It's mm-hmm. in the Bible. And I mean, it, and they it's, all somehow went by Betsy at some point. It's, well, it's weird. But it's also was, you know, you had Elizabeth the first. Right. I mean. Just a super common name back then. Um, still a common name. True. Uh, so anyways, her name was uh, Elizabeth Betsy Clifford. The couple came into a very large inheritance when James's father died. I mean, I hate that he died, but yay for money. Uh, don't go well. Uh, James was a farmer and well-known for being a hard worker as well as frugal. It was for these reasons that the town's militia decided to give James the title of captain. Oh, not because he was a good captain, but because he had the money, money. Oh, that's well, good. he was very, he was a very hard worker well, and, he, and, was, and he was very well known in the area. And so it wasn't so much the money that he had. It was just, he had been in that town his entire life and also, you know, was very well known. And so I think that part had more to do with it than, okay. than money. Um, just based on, because it also said he was very frugal, like he didn't okay. spend a lot. So, um, 
The family was very prosperous in Bowdenham, and many people said that Captain Purrington's mood was very affected by the finances in their home. Um, it's for this reason that it's extremely shocking that the family decided to move. Uh, James bought 100 acres of land in Augusta, Maine. The land had not been kept uh, for quite some time, and James went to Augusta a few months ahead of his family in order to start clearing the land by hand on his own. That's hard work. He built a small shelter for himself on the land and got to work. It took, uh, so from when he got it, he he went back and forth from Bowdenham to Augusta, you know, to see his family. He built a very small place for him there, but it took him, from everything that I've seen, it took him two full years to build them a home and to clear just six acres of land. How many kids are we talking? Just wait. Oh. So, uh, the Ballards owned the land right next to the Purringtons, and Martha Ballard, the matriarch of the family, was a midwife, and we will talk more about her later in the story. Captain Purrington finally moved his wife and eight children from Bowden, coming Maine, after that. No, from Bowden, Maine to Augusta um, in August of 1805. Again, too many children? Yes. <laughs> the children were Polly, 19, James, 17, Martha, 15, Benjamin, 12, Anna, 10, Nathaniel, 8, Nathan, 6, and Louisa, 18 months when they moved there. Well, I like the name. Technically, it's the time of their death. Um, <laughs> so the family moved into the farmhouse at, uh, I think it's Belgrade Road. By all accounts, the Purringtons seemed to be thriving. Neighbors described James as, quote, an independent farmer with a handsome estate of steady, correct, and industrious habits of good character and fair reputation and strongly attached to his family. But that all sounds great. It was too good to last for the Purrington family. The summer of 1806 had a bit of a drought, and farmers in the area were very concerned for their crops. Um, I know a lot of people don't live on or near farms, and it, and it's some people really aren't aware how dangerous even a small drought can be to mm-hmm. farmers. Um, you know, you just have to think of it in a lot of different ways. Um, yeah, it's it, it's dangerous because you don't have water, so you don't have crops. Summer is the time where, you know, you really need to harvest things. You really need things to grow. You mm-hmm. also, at this time, are very reliant on livestock. If they don't have water, they're going to die. So it's just it's just a whole big circle that's that's really unfortunate. Yep. Um the Purringtons did have cows and the lack of rain not only took away from the water supply but also didn't allow for vegetation to grow on the farm for the cows to eat. And again, like I said, this is a type of summer that could ruin a farm for years. And um, this is their first year on the farm. On this farm, yes. A few locals mentioned that James had even talked about how his family was destitute and he wasn't sure how he could feed his family. So they were destitute, but he came in, they came into a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Uh Oh, it was a combination of all these factors that led him to write a letter to his brother. So Sunday, July 6th of 1806, Betsy took their oldest daughter with her, uh, Polly to a prayer meeting at the church, and James stayed home with the rest of the children. He was writing a letter when Martha, who was the 15-year-old, asked him what he was writing. James quickly tried to conceal the letter and asked Martha to bring him the butcher knife from the kitchen. He claimed it needed to be sharpened. Later, kind of a trigger warning, light trigger warning for this, because some people could find this a little triggering, so just, just FYI. Uh, Later, Martha saw her father standing in front of the mirror, moving his left hand over his throat with the knife in his hand. When Martha asked again what her father was doing, he said nothing and laid the knife down on the table. Uh, Martha, little snitch, immediately told her mom what happened as soon as she got home. 
Well, that's disturbing. I have feelings. Um, Betsy found the letter her husband had been writing. And the letter said, Dear brother, these lines... Keep in mind, guys, a lot of people did not write very well back in these days. It is not that I'm pronoun- that I'm saying words incorrectly. It's that this is how it's written. Trust me, it's hurting me. <laughs> so, dear brother, these lines is to let you know that I am going on a long journey. And I would have you sell what I have and put it out to interest and put out my boys to trades. Or send them to see. I cannot see the distress of my family. God only knows my distress. I would have you put Nathaniel to Uncle Perrington to a tanner's trade. I want James to go to school until sufficient to attend in a store. Benjamin to blacksmith's trade or to what you think best. But to be sure to give them learning if it takes all. Divide what is left, for I am no more. Oof. When confronted by his wife about the letter, you know, the implication in the letter that he was going to end his life, uh, you know, obviously she was very distraught. Mm -hmm. Um, James tried to console Betsy and told her that he didn't have any intention to end his life, but instead he just had a premonition that he was going to die, so he wanted to put his affairs in order. So, didn't help. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, we're going to go back to Martha Ballard that I mentioned before. Um, her diary is the only firsthand account of what occurred that night. Uh, Martha Moore Ballard was a midwife and healer born in Oxford, Massachusetts on February 9th, 1735. So, she was about 25 years older at the time, you know, than, than James Burrington. Mm-hmm. Both her uncle and brother-in-law were physicians, and it is likely where her curiosity for the medical field came from. And that's the only kind of medicine a woman could practice at the time. Mm-hmm. She, married, out there. she married her husband in 1754, and they had nine children. Do I need to even say it at this point? Yes. Way too many. <laughs> Not, no. 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 They outnumber you. There could be a mutiny. They can overthrow you. <laughs> I am just saying it's too many gang. They get together, gang up with one another, and they overthrow the government in the household. That's all I'm saying can happen. It's dangerous. Okay, you d- no more kids than you have hands. <laughs> None. Okay, no more kids than you have hands. This is my philosophy. I'm just saying you need to have one to one coverage. Yes. Especially, and when the kids start to outnumber you and your partner, look, you don't know what could happen. I'm just well, saying. My sister it's... thought she had that covered, then surprise! <laughs> I'm just saying. So, unfortunately, though, three of the nine children died in a diphtheria epidemic oh, in 1769. Sad. Martha delivered around 816 babies in the 27 years that she documented in her diary. How many did you say? 816. Wow. Uh, this That's di- a lot of babies. I know. This diary also has entries that discussed Martha using local plants and ingredients from local physicians to make medicines and administering them to patients. So she was kind of. A bit of a pharmacist that, but she was a woman, so she obviously. was a healer, mm-hmm. and that yeah, and that's why it said before she was a healer. She sometimes was asked to observe autopsies, and eighty five of those instances were recorded in her diary. Hmm. In seventeen eighty nine, Martha testified in a very high profile case where a judge was accused of assaulting the wife of a minister. It was not uncommon for Martha to take testimonies from unwed unwed mothers uh, that were later used in paternity suits, which Mm. paternity suits, obviously, you know, debating the paternity of the father, you know, the child for the father and and so on. Uh, Martha, fun fact, was also related to the famous 
Clara Barton. You know who Clara Barton is? Hold on. Civil War. There you go. Hold on. It's going to come to me. (laughs) It's not coming, but I should know this. I'm very mad at myself. Clara was known for her role in the American Civil War, and she founded the American Red Cross. Yes! See, I knew, I was like, it's <laughs> medical. It's the, it's the Civil yep. War, but I, all I could think of was Florence Nightingale, and it was wrong, <laughs> but I knew it was like that. Yes. So, because we have international listeners, um, if you don't know, the American Red Cross is a nonprofit humanitarian organization. It provides disaster relief, emergency assistance, and disaster preparedness preparedness education in the U.S. So anytime um, a you tornado know, comes through your yeah, town, tornado comes through uh, Hurricane Katrina, when there are pandemics like we just had, the American Red Cross is really uh, the kind of the first line of defense other than FEMA. And I will say uh, the tornado that did come through, I mean, like it came through my town, like, like mm-hmm. Kayla said, like just a few doors down from my house, like my mm-hmm. road was blocked by a huge tree. That was one of the first trucks that we saw was American Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Cross. And uh, so, yeah, and they actually do deal a lot with international um, affairs as well. Sometimes the American Red Cross will go to other countries Mm -hmm. uh, to give vaccines and and different things like that. So just provide relief somehow, medical or whatever. Our friend Martha, her she was related to Clara Bart. That's very cool. Yeah, So very interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, The accounts we have from Martha's life are solely thanks to her diary that she kept. The diary had more than 1,400 pages that began with short entries about daily life, which included the weather. And towards the end, the entries were very long and descriptive. So it just kind of seems like the more she wrote, the more she liked to write, the more in-depth everything became. Well, and probably she wasn't as active as she got older, too. Mm Mm-hmm. She discussed scandals, local crimes, and hard times that her family encountered. One entry of note was when she found it appalling. She was appalled. 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 (laughs) That children in New England were allowed to choose their romantic partners if the partner was in the same economic class. How dare you choose your significant other. Oh, well, what did she think if they chose somebody who was not in the same economic class? Oh, she, she, oh, she was not having it. Her she last. She's going to have to lay down on the chase lounge. I know. She's, get some uh, she's a fainting couch. Um, <laughs> her last entry was in 1812, and the last birth that she attended was April 26th of 1812. Hmm. Um, she died pretty soon, soon after. The diary was then passed down through a few generations until it was donated to the Maine State Library in 1930. In 1997, that's the year I graduated high school. I was six. PBS made your face. <laughs> PBS made a documentary film based on her diary called A Midwife's Tale. Um, We have this diary to thank for the firsthand account of the events that happened the night of the Purrington family massacre. So a pamphlet was printed by Peter Eads on July 11th of 1806, which described the scene in detail. I'm going to read pieces of this pamphlet and your trigger warning on this one's probably at a medium. Um. The description's pretty long, and there are graphic details to it. I'll uh, let you know when the description is over, and I'll put in the show notes, kind of like I did for the HARP episode, kind of the timestamps for the beginning and end, just because it's a little longer in case you want to skip over it. You, you know, you have the opportunity to do so if you would like. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> so, we're going to get into it in three, two, one. Quote, at an early hour on Wednesday morning last, the inhabitants of this town were alarmed with the dreadful information that Captain James Purrington of this place in cold blood had murdered his wife, six children, and himself. His oldest son with a slight wound escaped and his second daughter was found desperately wounded and probably supposed dead by the father. Between the hours of two and three, a near neighbor, Mr. Dean Wyman, 
was awakened by the lad who escaped with an incoherent account of the horrid scene from which he just fled. He, with a Mr. Ballard, another neighbor, which, side note, Mr. Ballard, that's Martha Ballard, who we talked about, the midwife, mm-hmm. that's her, believe it's her son. We'll get to it. Um, but just kind of context. Instantly repaired to the fatal spot and hereafter have lighted a candle. A scene was presented which beggars all description. In the outer room lay prostrate on his face and weltering in his gore the perpetrator of the dreadful deed. His throat cut in the most shocking manner and the bloody razor lying on a table by his side. Mm. In an adjoining bedroom lay Miss Purrington in her bed. Her head on... Sorry, guys. I I warned you. Her head almost severed from her body. Ooh. Um, And near her on the floor, a daughter of about 10 years old, who probably hearing the cries of her mother, ran to go check on her. Oh, no. In which she slept, and she was murdered by her side. In another, they say apartment, but it's like a room. Right. Um, was found the two oldest and the youngest daughters. The first, age 19, dreadfully butchered. The second, desperately wounded, uh, reclining her head on the body of, sorry, guys, the 18-month-old child. And in a state of horror and almost total insensibility, in the room with their father, lay in bed with their throats cut, two youngest sons. The one ate, the other six, and in another room was found on the hearth, most dreadfully mangled, the second son, age 12. He, yeah, he had fallen with his trousers under one arm, which he had attempted to escape. On the breastwork over the fireplace was the distinct impression of a bloody hand where the unhappy victim probably supported himself before he fell. The whole house seemed covered with blood and near the body of the murderer lay the deadly axe. From the surviving daughter, we have no account of this transaction. Her dangerous situation prevents any communication and but faint expectations are entertained for her recovery. From the son aged 17, we learn the following. That he was awakened by the piercing cries of his mother and involuntarily shrieking himself, he leapt from his bed and ran towards the door of his apartment. He was met by his father with an axe in his hand. The moon shone bright. His father then struck him, but being so near each other, the axe passed over one shoulder and one corner of it entered his back, making a slight wound. His father then struck him at one or two struck at him once or twice and missed him at this moment his younger brother who slept in the same bed with him jumped from it and attempted to get out at the door to prevent this the father attacked him which gave the eldest an opportunity to escape during the dreadful conflict not a word was uttered from the appearance of his wounds generally it's not a word was uttered Mm -mm. It seems to have been the design, the design of Purrington to dissever the heads from the bodies, excepting the two youngest whose throat it supposedly were cut with a razor. The oldest daughter and second son had several wounds, the probable consequence of their resistance. We have no evidence that leads us to satisfactory of the motives for this barbaric and unnatural deed. And that's the end of the description. How sad. What's eerie is that he didn't say anything. Yeah. Like, was he in a trance? Had he just steeled himself for it and just, he was just, this has just got to get done? Because I know, yeah. like, um, I started taking a new medicine and I had to give myself a shot. And I don't like the needle things. <laughs> like, when I go to the doctor and I have to have a shot, like, I don't love shots. I detest having to get them to take my blood because God gave me the blood on the inside and that's where it should stay. <laughs> um, and they have to keep the needle in there a really long time. It's, I don't, I don't do well with it. Um, it just makes me woozy. But having a shot doesn't really bother me that much. I don't love it, but I had to give myself a shot with this new medicine that I'm taking. And like when I had to do that, I had to just take a breath mm-hmm. And just do it. Like I had to just go there mm-hmm. 
get myself ready and do it. And I just had to not think about it and mm-hmm. just do it. And so maybe, I mean, those are two very different yeah. things. I have some theories. Um, but, yeah, it's it's very eerie that he didn't say anything. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I know that description was really long, but it's kind of the main account that we have of the crime scene. The pamphlet goes on to include the information regarding the letter to James's brother and how the family was on the border of becoming destitute. It also states that James ground the axe before he went to bed that night, and when he retired to bed, he was reading his Bible. Hmm. Um, and the Bible was actually, like, grossly enough, was still opened when the family was found, and it was open to Ezekiel chapter 9, which said, according to this quote, He cried also into mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroyed weapon in hand. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark. Which is really creepy. Like, I don't I don't know. It's weird. Uh... That's all flowery, and I don't really <laughs> read that version of the Bible. No, um, that was 1806. I don't think anybody does anymore. How about okay. we read a more... Um, yes, I think that'll be helpful. Yeah, a more modern version. So it's Ezekiel... What is it? Chapter Ezekiel? 9. Chapter 9. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... It's the slaughter of the idolaters is what that heading is mm-hmm. for that chapter. Uh, Verse 1 says, Then the Lord thundered, Bring on the man appointed to punish the city. Tell them to bring their weapons with them. Six men soon appeared from the upper gate that faces north, each carrying a deadly weapon in his hand. Um, With them was a man dressed in linen who carried a writer's case at his side. They all went to the temple courtyard and stood beside the bronze altar. And there's a whole lot of description. And then down in verse 5, it says, Then I heard the Lord say to the other men, Follow him through the city and kill everyone whose forehead is not marked. Show no mercy, have no pity. Kill them all, old and young, girls and women and little children. But do not touch anyone with the mark. Begin right here at the temple. So they began killing the 70 leaders. Ooh. That's... That's harsh, man. Which also, though, makes sense when he says... Idolaters. Idolaters. But he also says, um, show no mercy. Yeah. Because he just, I mean, he just went mm-hmm. at it. And didn't, when well, he didn't say anything. Mm-mm. So that does make it, make a little more sense. Yeah, but it... it that it, was the NLT version, in case you're wondering. It was very... It's very weird. I don't, I don't know. All right, so we'll go into the account of Martha Ballard um, that she wrote down in her diary from that night. Martha and her husband were woken at about three in the morning um, by two of their neighbors stating the Purrington family were all dead except for 17-year-old James. Martha's son— So the other daughter did die? Not at this time. Okay. They thought she was dead. Okay. Um, so, so, yeah. Martha's son, Jonathan, went to the neighbor— went with the neighbors over to the Purrington home. When Jonathan returned from the Purringtons, he described what he saw to his mother, and she wrote it down in her diary, and it said, quote, The two went to the house where the horrid scene was perpetrated. My son went in and found a candle, which he lit, and to his great surprise saw Purrington, his wife, and six children's corpses. Martha, he perceived, had life remaining who was moved to his house. Surgical aid was immediately called, and she remains alive as of yet. My husband went and returned before sunrise when, after taking a little food, he and I went to the house where to behold the most shocking scene that was even seen in this part of the world. May an indefinitely good God grant that we may all take suitable notice of this horrid deed. Learn wisdom therefrom. The corpses were removed to his barn or they were washed and laid side by side. A horrid spectacle which many hundred persons came to behold. It was there till near night when son Jonathan conducted me to his house and gave me refreshment. 
The coffins were brought and the corpses carried in a wagon and deposited in the Augusta Meeting House. The end. So, <clears throat> much like with our uh, case with Lovey Weeks and Elma Sands. It was a spectacle. It, hundreds of people just walking by. Checking well, who profited out. from that one? Nobody. Well, good. Not that I know at, of. At least there's that. Not that I know of. Um, uh, yeah, so. It chaps my hog. <laughs> the daughter who initially survived Martha, she was the 15-year-old that saw her dad writing the letter. Mm. So she's the one um, who initially survived. She did receive medical attention, but she died uh, a few days later, leaving James the only surviving yes. member of the Purrington family. I bet he had survivor's guilt. Yeah, the coroner summoned an, uh, a jury of inquest, and the jury found that James, quote, uh, which Captain Purrington, not James the son, mm. just to be, be clear, um, quote, of his malice aforethought, did kill and murder his wife and children, and as a felon, did voluntarily kill and murder himself. Betsy Purrington and six of her children were buried together in an unmarked mass grave in the common burying ground in Augusta. And Why it, unmarked? It's just the area that it was in. It was a common burial area. Um, and they actually passed the fort that we originally discussed in the beginning. It was noted that that was one of the places that they had to pass in order to get to the burial ground. So just interesting kind of to know where the location kind of is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. So... Um, but James Purrington, Captain James Purrington, was not buried in a cemetery at all. I was going to say, I hope that he was not put with them because. Mm -mm. No, they decided to, depending on people's thoughts on the afterlife and, oh, you know, no. whether you, what happens with you and where you go, um, you know, or if you just become a ghost, who knows, life. Um, he was buried in a hole. On the other side of the road, and... On the other side of the road from his family, like mm -hmm. directly across? Okay. Not directly across. It just says it was across from the cemetery. Okay. Okay. Um, Not on hallowed ground? Correct. So, he was buried in a hole on the side of the road with his only company being the axe and razor that he used Ooh. in his crime. And that is the Purrington Family Massacre. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, so, so I want to know what happened to the son that survived. I want to know more. He, it, from everything that I saw, because I tried to find like, more information, epilogue. he didn't have any children. That mm -hmm. that we do know. Um, so he didn't go on to have any kids himself. Um, He's probably messed up. I mean, yeah. I, and I'm not saying that lightly. I mean, right. like, it, it took a toll on him, I'm he sure. Pro right. He, he most likely, what, is speculated is that he left the area. Um, yeah. So, no but it's, memories, thank yeah. you. But a lot of people who have researched this story um, and have gone forward to try and find out what happened to James did find out that he did not have any children. I wonder um, if he changed his name. I mean, I would. I mean. Because Purrington is not really a name that you forget. It's not no. one that is like no. common. No, not at all. So, and, and I don't also, know. I, <sighs> I have theories. You always have theories. I do. I mean, what do you, why do you think he did it? Because originally he wasn't going to. He wrote the letter, remember? He told his brother what he wanted to happen with his money. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, like, what's, what's your thought? I think that, here's my thought. <laughs> well, I mean, I was trying to think how to, to put it in, into words. Um, he was going to take the coward's way out. Right. And not have to deal with the... Which, to be clear, we're not saying no, that... No, 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 no. We're not... I know, I'm just... I'm, I'm making clear. We're not saying that ending your life is the coward's way out to no, be No, and that's not what I mean. Clear. Correct. I just wanted to make sure that was yes. noted. Yes. That, that That's... I'm sorry. That, that didn't come out right. <laughs> no, what I'm fine. meaning is... He he didn't want to have to see the disappointment in his wife's face or eyes and voice. But since the cat got out of the bag, he was like, well, let's just take That's care of him all. That's what I think, too. 
That I mean, that's exactly what I think. Now, well, she knows now, so. Well, and everybody said that his mood was directly related to how much money they had at the time Boom. in the old town that they lived in. So, so I, what happened to all the money? I don't know. I don't know if it was poor. It, it never, I thought you had more information. I know. I told you this one was hard. It was. I thought you were holding back on me. You were going to surprise me with something. No, it was hard to find stuff on this one. I had to dig up a lot. <sighs> but it. Um, this is actually probably one of the longest cases that I researched because uh, I had to f- try and find stuff on you it. Spent the it, most time researching this case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ding ding. Um. <laughs> so yeah, I agree. I mean, there is a case for saying mental health could very well be involved in this i personally think well, i think anytime a suicide is is in the picture that it's mental health right um, I, I think so and i will say it is more difficult to and it it is the harder choice to stay than to decide to leave i will say that mm-hmm. because it is harder mm-hmm. i will i mean i will say that i think that is very much true because it's right. hard it's hard. And, and like you said, I think there's a good, I, it's one of those things. And the reason, so the reason that the point where I think everything could have changed had one and not to victim blame, not to say it is anyone's fault. I think the one point that all of it could have been different is if Martha never told her mom about the letter. Because at that point, he had only intended to end his own life. But I think that when he, when his wife found out, I think it, like you said, you let the cat out of the bag on what your plan was. And it's like, all right, well, if I'm not going to take me, I'm going to take all of them. (sighs) You know, know what I mean? Because then if, uh, yeah. if you follow through with what you did, your wife now knows why you did it. Well, but also, I mean, that he may have already decided to change his mind. You know, he may have already changed his mind know. before that. I don't know. I, it, it's very, it's just very odd that in the beginning it was only going to be himself. And then keep in mind. Not even a day later, yeah. he changes his mind. And it's just sad to me. Oh, it's anyway, very you sad. look at it that somebody thinks that the only answer. Exactly. It, That's, it's, it's so no. sad to me because there's always another mm-hmm. answer. And stuff, you know, time can get hard. Um, and, and I mean, I and have to say. And we are very well aware of that. Like, yes. We, we and do and I that. have to say, I have been. So incredibly blessed and incredibly lucky in my life that I have not had hard, hard right, thoughts times of that. Like, right. people, like people have. No, I mean, and just like struggle mm. as far as oh, okay. monetarily. Um, I mean, not that I've, you know, had everything given to me and I've had all the latest and greatest. I'm just saying I have not had to worry about, am I going to have enough money to pay for power, mm-hmm. pay for food, mm-hmm. have gas in my car? Um, have clothes to wear, let alone, you know, be able to go on a field trip or have not just the nicest, newest shoes that'll go just right with an outfit, but a pair of shoes that fit. You know, I've mm-hmm. not had those worries. And I recognize that I am very blessed. And, you know, there are others <coughs> who can't say that. I totally get that. Right. And it's easy, so easy for me to say, mm-hmm. it's it's going to get better. There's, right. You know, but it, it will. It has to. It will. And if I can help you, I will. Right. And, and I mean, and then coming from the other side where, I mean, I have dealt with some very difficult things in my life. Not to go into detail of any of them, but I have had very trying times that I've dealt with in my life. and. What you're saying, like, I understand both perspectives of things because I can see how you want to tell someone things are going to get better. Things are going to be good. But when you're in the middle of it, oh no, it doesn't look. I mean, I mean, and I get it. I'm saying just from 
because I'm a fixer. I want to fit. I mean, everybody that knows me knows I want to fix everything. I want to make it better. If I can hurt instead of you, I would much rather it. Like, I, that's just how I am. But I know those times when you're sitting there and you think there's no end to this situation. There's no way I'm going to, you know. And yes, eventually, you know, you work your way through those hard times in your life. and. Unfortunately, some people don't don't have. Um, I can't they don't say have the support. I can't. System. Yes, they don't have the support to carry them through those mm-hmm. times, which is how some of these situations yeah. happen. Well, and, and I will you know, say, I've had problems. Right. right I've right. had. Lord mercy, I've had problems. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying. It looks like his issue was monetarily. Mm-hmm. I have not been destitute in that sense in my mm-hmm. life. I, I, I can't relate to that. Mm-hmm. Now, other issues, I have had a plenty. I mm-hmm. mean, I have been left out. I've, I've been through depression. I have been through, I mean, I got all, right. I've, I've got the crazy pills. I got the happy pills. They're you not know, crazy pills. Um, They're the calm down ones. <laughs> no, no, no. My happy pills are my calm down pills. Uh, the crazy pills are just to keep me, you know, <laughs> kind of level to keep the crazy out um, or keep the crazy at a at a, a constant level and not to get too much. Um, you know, I mean, I, I have problems. I'm just saying I can't relate to the. Mm-hmm monetarily again not saying that i'm rolling in the dough because i'm not my husband will definitely tell you that i'm not <laughs> mr check but not say that i love so much um but i just i don't yeah i can't i don't understand that mindset because i've not been there right but right anyway you know and uh, i mean i'm not i can't say that i I'll say it this way. I grew up in some areas where that is the case for a lot of people. Yes. My family, um, both sides of my family actually, come from areas that, you know, it's it's one of those areas that, you know, one area is really nice, the other area is really not. Like, it's it's one of those places that... Literally different sides of the track. Yes. And, and but just a door down two doors down sure. you know it's just it's it's um where and a lot of my family lives in those kinds of areas where you have areas that are super nice and then you have the areas that a lot of people there are destitute and i grew up in and around those areas in my life and so uh you know it is hard and my family went through a really hard time um during the financial crisis of like 2009, it was rough because my mom was a real estate agent. Mm. And I mean, real estate just like bottomed out and yeah. not to say like anything negative about that time, but that was the time when a lot of people were realizing, Hey, like not knowing what to do. And that was a big time for a lot of people to choose to end a lot their lives. of bad things happened. and it and you know so someone that we know i had to file for bankruptcy yes at and, that time. And, and it's yeah and i mean people you would never expect and so i do think that there is a, a very strong case to say that you know a lot of people say and i hate the term and Please understand, Lee and I both, we are very well aware of our privilege of where we stand today. Absolutely. I mean, even though I have my own house, I mean, I do fully financially support myself. Um, and, you know, you know, we're very well aware of that privilege. But also, I come from the side of there was a time and point in my life, I won't say when or anything, that the power wasn't on. For a little while or, you know, just things like that. And at no fault of anyone's uh, just, you know, situations that happen. But, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, money can't really buy you happiness. I understand the concept of that phrase. 
That's what I'll say. I understand the concept of the phrase of money can't buy happiness. However, it can buy it can fix a lot of problems. I mean, like it can. It, it's one of those things that it does make it does it help makes you a with big security. difference. It does help with. I mean, it does yes. it helps you with security. And a lot of people are very money insecure in the world that we live in, and it's Absolutely. very unfortunate. And you know. And one thing that is misquoted so often, Mm -hmm. people say money is the root of all evil. That is not Mm -hmm. the verse. The verse is the love of money is Mm -hmm. the root of all evil. And and, and that makes it totally different. You know, because people say, well, you know, these celebrities have money and they're still depressed. Yeah. I mean, money's not going to. Right. Money's not going to fix your depression. No. I mean, money lets you sit in a super nice air conditioned home with food in the refrigerator. But who are you sharing it with? And that's that's I think where a lot of people confuse mm-hmm. that term. Right. And and you know, there's a lot of people, you know, you see it with different um athletes and things like that who they am guys, we are in Alabama. So our, you know, we obviously have the University of Alabama. I Hold won't go up. into it. But she doesn't go for the no. best team in the but, nation. <laughs> but a lot of um, teenagers are brought in to that college because mm-hmm. they can play sports. Yes. And they're given a full ride scholarship. Yes, they are. And, it's, and they it, go on to play in the NFL. and. I think that is one of the most dangerous things you can do it to can someone be. in their early 20s. It say, can be, absolutely. We're going to not only pay for you to go to college, we're going to give you a scholarship to go to college solely because you can play football. Because we do, we we know there are a lot of people who end up going into sports that really can't read and write. Like they were pushed there through. There can be. They were pushed through the education system because they could play sports or because, it, sorry, I'm not going to get on my soapbox for education, but a lot of times it is, it's, it, I'm pushing them to the next grade to be someone else's problem. And, and I'm not going to say that doesn't happen right. because it does. It does. But, and, and that's there are some, I'm, some programs that you are exactly right. Mm-hmm. That happens. And, and I think it's unfortunate when you have students who do go down that path and then they've only been playing football at, at Alabama or whoever for two years. And then they're drafted after two, they didn't finish college, not yeah. to say there's anything wrong with finishing or not finishing right. college, college. But what if you get an injury before you play one time? Right. Right. And that's why I have loved, you know, here recently, the players that choose to stay another mm-hmm. year, yeah, finish their degree exactly because that makes me so that makes me even more proud of them because it it mm-hmm. shows that they are valuing their education. So what I think the reason I say this and the reason that I say this is um, relating to money and relating to this case and these issues is because you see these kids who came from an area who ca- who still have family members that are in poverty like below and you poverty want them to be line a role model for them. and you do but you've been you're barely in college you're drafted in the NFL and the NFL goes here's 10 million dollars yeah congratulations and it's they it just is blow through it scary yeah to oh, do that i agree with I, that. I mean, you know what i mean and that's that's why i think a lot of people go oh well you see that and money can't buy happiness and it's like no that's not necessarily the case keep in mind you're giving millions of dollars to, to a kid 20 year old to a kid I mean, to, yes and and i think a really unfortunate but good example of that is the Aaron Hernandez case. Aaron Hernandez did grow up. He's the one that played for the Patriots that um, allegedly murdered someone and ended up in jail and, you know, ended up, you know, ending his life while he was in, in jail. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's a very tragic case for a lot of reasons. Mm-hmm. I don't, uh, I don't condone what he did. I, I think it's. I think it's terrible. I think. Um, I think it is 
he he is one of those players that didn't grow up with a lot. He was, you know, abused by his father. He th- there were a lot of instances in his life. He also allegedly struggled with his sexuality at different times and had different things. He was assaulted at different times. And so, but you're taking someone who like that played football, was amazing at football, okay. made it. And that through. was his outlet. Mm-hmm. That was his outlet. And then you get a team that comes to you and says, here's $20 million. Go. Okay. I mean, and you, you know, and in your mind, because you grew up and you never had the money, now I have the money. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, it's just, and it's one of those things of like, you can't look at that and say, oh, well, you know, money's not going to buy you happiness. Because no, it's not. But when you come from a money insecure lifestyle, yeah. it's very, you know, I think that that's. It's a really good distraction. It is. It is. It's a really good and distraction. I, personally, in my opinion, I think that when that happens, I think just like if somebody wins the lottery, I think you need to immediately get a financial advisor. Gosh, yes. I mean, you. Or get a tech with Nazi in your life. <laughs> <laughs> um, Same thing. You know, I personally think that the best thing, you know, in those cases, and I know this is a tangent on the NFL, but I think that in those cases, especially with the NFL, You're drafting such young people. I think that it should be mandatory that when they are drafted, I think that money should go into a trust and you should have a financial advisor who can help you manage that money. But they should not have to, they they should not have the financial manager for you. You should be able to choose your own. That's what I'm saying is you should be, but that should be a requirement. I, th- I agree with that. Um, I agree to with that. Do that. Absolutely. That, that, you know, here's here's this, but we're going to require you to do this. Like the, there are certain things you need to do before we hand you this twenty yeah. million dollars. And I, I and you, know, you know, I don't know what all the requirements are. I don't either. You know. I mean, but based off of some of the lives that we've seen of some of these people, yeah. is they are but now, dead broke. But now. some of them, some of them are really good. I and mean, some of them have been mm-hmm. business majors, and they have finished finish mm-hmm. school and they have done things that mm-hmm. you're like okay oh yeah i mean there's a good majority you know buying of- their mama's houses <laughs> um yes that is what you want to see i mean and it's you know and there are those cases when that does happen but you also see a lot of uh players that go to the nfl and end up getting injured or being out after a few years yeah. and then now they don't have money like yeah. they, it's gone they they spent it it's gone yeah they've got nothing to fall back on yeah. and they didn't finish their because college because you thought it was always going to be there yeah and they they didn't finish college mm-hmm. they didn't you know you know and not college is a scam i'll say it again um but <laughs> go into a trade people please you will it's make, not a scam you'll make, you'll make a lot of money but there's nothing there's More nothing people do need to go into trades yeah. because they're dying it's, out it's because there's such a push for college which we need people who are college you educated as well, but we need people who are, who mm-hmm. you know, we need welders, we need electricians, we need plumbers, we need all the things. All we the need things. builders. We need, mm-hmm. I mean, all the things. We need all these Ooh, if people. you're a builder right now, my gosh, oh. at the price of things. Yes, I'm going to Disney World now instead of getting a new kitchen <laughs> for my 20th anniversary. You know, I I just... I think a big basis of this case, I do think, as they said, that his mood was directly related to how much money they had. Um, And sometimes as a man, mm -hmm. that is very much. That's a very emasculating Uh thing, especially Uh in this time when it is your job to provide for your family. It is 100% your job. And you were doing it before. Yeah. That's why I don't know why they moved. Yeah. It's very weird. Why? Maybe they wanted more land. Maybe they thought they could be more successful somewhere else. Well, and you I said don't he moved to start a new life mm-hmm. at the beginning of it. And I, I remember thinking you were you were on mm-hmm. a roll, so I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> I actually stopped the interruption. You'd be amazed at the interruptions I stop because <laughs> most of my um, anyway. Um, I wanted to ask. Well, what was the old life like? Mm-hmm. Why were they starting a new life? Right. Well, it, it's never been said, and like I, like I said before about this case, it's really hard to find information um, on it, unfortunately. Um, but 
I mean, everything that I that I read and everything that I saw from all the sources, they all kind of said the same thing: is that he was starting. They were starting a new life yeah. in a new town, but there was never any indication that something negative happened. Yeah, in their because old he had such town. good standing, mm-hmm. and they made him this. Mm-hmm. You know, but people in this new town loved him. They loved him because keep in mind, he was there for two years before his entire family moved there. So it was said like a lot of people really like it seemed that he was gaining the same reputation in this area that he had in the old town that he lived in. So I think it's a combination. I think maybe they put all the money into the farm. May I mean, they bought 100 acres of land. That's a lot. Five thousand dollars. Um, Five thousand dollars. <laughs> Five thousand. Um, Sorry, but you know that's maybe maybe that was the thing. Maybe they decided to bet it all on the farm, and this is what we're going to do, and this is going to be successful. And literally this is, bet the farm. Bet the farm. <laughs> you know, it's in. It's just. It's unfortunate. I hate it. It's it's really unfortunate. It, it really is, uh, and and it just makes me sad anytime I see someone who just gives up and, mm-hmm. and can't see or, or doesn't have the, um, just, you don't have the support to see yeah, that. that you're so much more than this one thing. And yeah, you have people depending on you, but they love you too. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and you're more than just this one thing and, mm-hmm. and, and they love you and you're more than just Which the farm. I think Possibly that is why his plan changed. I think it was kind of well noted that when his wife found the letter, mm. she was distraught. Like, and maybe she said, "We love you. We would miss you." And, and so he was like, "Well, I'm not going to put him through that." I think that was what it was. Oh, yeah. I think that's yeah. the, because he, because so originally. So I love him so much, so I'm going to kill him? Yeah. Which makes absolutely Obviously no sense. Obviously he was out of his mind. Right. He was but out of his mind. It's just, I think based off of the story and based off of everything, you know, and the letter, he, he wasn't going to do that in the first place. And then for him to change his mind after, you know, Martha that told her sense. mom, I think that, I think it was a case of. One, sorry, trigger warning for people who you don't want to hear about chosen life ending. But one, you originally thought you were going to take yourself out of this world because the world would be better without you. That's number one. Then you find out that, no, people do want you there, but you still don't see a way out, right? Because everything is still on your shoulders. and so. By you saying, hey, no, we want you here, I would be so sad. But you're like, well, I still don't need to be here because it's going to be bad. Okay, so we'll just take we'll all just the problem We'll just do everything. Out. Yeah. I think, that, I think that is more of what happened. And I think when you get in a state like that, so eerie for them to say he didn't say anything. Yeah. I, I just He was just in a trance. He was trance. just in a state. Yes. It's, I don't know, it's crazy. It's it's a crazy case and unfortunately not well known. So, yeah. you know, again, the two other podcasts that are out there that talk about it, uh, murder, she told and, and then Massachusetts. <laughs> no, no, new England, new England. Yeah. Uh, strange new England. Yeah. Strange. New so, England. uh, you know, those podcasts also covered it. I have not listened to them. I'm going to, um, so, yeah, you know, you want to hear more about it or hear other opinions, uh, go listen to it. That'd be, you know, support them, too. They had great information and did a really great job on their research. Oh, <laughs> that's a nice. Dang. All right. Well, follow us on Instagram at One Nation Under Crime and on Twitter at ONUC Pod. If you love our podcast as much as we do, and we know you do. Uh, yeah. And you should. You should. Recommend us to everyone. 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 Literally everyone you see. Your waiter. <laughs> Maybe not your waiter. They don't like that very much. Yeah, probably not. Um, and if you feel like it, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We would greatly appreciate it. A whole lot. And please leave a comment if you do. Um, algorithms and such makes more sense. I don't know. 
weird things. Um, we do have a Patreon if you feel so inclined to help with the cost of making and hosting the show. Uh, you can donate to our Patreon. Just go to Patreon and search for One Nation Under Crime. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, stories, you want to email us, go for it. Our email address is one nation under crime at gmail.com. We would love to read them and we will, of course, respond. Um, we'll also respond to your Instagram messages or anything like that. So please talk to us. We yep. would love to hear from you. Yep, yep. Whew, so again, dang, it's a long one. It's long winded. Not us. <laughs> never. Never. So we appreciate you guys uh, listening to this week's episode of One Nation Under Crime. Thank you for joining us. Yet again for another week of crime. And, you know, we'll see you here next week. Same time. Different crime. And just remember that there isn't always liberty and justice for all. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.